All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thanks again for making some time to be with us today. We appreciate you joining us for the last user group for this year. So we'll uh, be taking a break between December and January and we'll be back online February, uh, February 15th, I think it will be, for today after Valentine's Day for our US and uh, European friends. So thanks again for joining us. Let's dive straight in. And today's all about the Eloqua landing page design editor. So as most of you know, just some housekeeping, uh, the sessions are recorded on Zoom. Replays are available on our website. You can access those at any time. Uh, please feel free to ask questions throughout. So please use the Q&A and uh, be more than happy to uh, multitask and answer those for you. And uh, keep in mind they are open, of course. So if you do use the Q&A, uh, anybody can uh, see that. So you may want to upvote somebody else's question. If you do want to ask a more private question, please use the, the chat to do that. And just to introduce myself, my name is Derek Bell. I'm the Director of Customer Success and marketing here at Marketing Cube. So I'm thrilled to be with you this morning and this afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Let's have a close look at the agenda. So we want to give you a quick overview of the key areas of the landing page and form design editors. We want to also explore greater personalization using field mergers and dynamic, dynamic content across both editors. Just as you have in the email editor, we can do the same thing from a landing page point of view as well. We'll also look at some ideas and tips around previewing and testing your assets to make sure you're happy with them. Um, and also looking at some insight and dashboard analytics. And if we have some time, we'll get through some of the updates with 22D, uh, primarily some insight reports, which are interesting. Now, given that the focus this month uh, is definitely about landing pages and forms, I thought it would be interesting to give you some numbers based on the performance of our campaign this month and also looking sort of across the year as we've been running the user group webinar. So the, the, the user group is a little bit different to maybe a standard webinar, unless you have a cycle, I suppose. So for us, the user group occurs every month. It happens twice uh, every month, once for our Asia Pack audience and then another session live for you guys as well. But um, there are, there's a, a fairly standard process that we follow for the user group each month. And that is to send out basically two rounds of invitations arguably a third. So let's go through those. So the first thing we do is at the end of the user group, we once we've written up the blog and we've got the video recordings all taken care of and they're sitting on uh, landing pages for you to access the replays, we send out the post event emails. And so what we're seeing on a fairly consistent basis, and this month it was in fact 22%, so 22% of people who registered for November did so off the back of the thank you for joining us or sorry we missed you emails that followed the October user group. So the message there is that often it's a great idea to try and strike while the iron's hot, so to speak, and to uh, capture that audience while you've got them engaged and let's get them interested in the next event that's happening. And when you've got something like the user group, which is happens every month, so there's continuity there for people. They kind of know it's going to be at the same time each month, et cetera. So it's a little bit easier for them to get into a rhythm. Uh, it makes it a bit easier. But um, always something to think about. Those post-event communications are so valuable. Don't just leave it with pretty pictures from an event or you know, click here to download something. Try, if you can, if your schedule allows and you're organized, uh, get them organized and get them registered for the next event that's happening. So that's the post-event communications, 22%. The primary round of invitations is, uh, is still the biggest number of registrants at 60%, literally a nice even 60%. Uh, of people who received the first invitation to register did so off the back of that first email. Now, there'll always be a group of people who miss that email. Perhaps they open it, but don't register for whatever reason. Maybe they're busy. So there's always a second round of invitations as well. Now, those second round of invitations are only sent to people who, and they're slightly different. There's two communications. One goes to those who didn't open the first communication at all uh, and didn't register. And the second, uh, the second, second invitation, if that makes sense, um, goes to those people who did open the first one but did not register. And so that email is just worded ever so slightly 
differently uh, in a, a subtle way, acknowledging that, hey, looks like you've had a chance to look at the first email, but you've maybe not got a chance to register. Here's your chance to do that. And so that email, the second email, um, is 18%. So we get 18% of registrants this month from that round of communication. So the simple message I would share with you is that uh, simply sending one email uh, is not sufficient. Uh, if you really wanna get the best result, uh, you really need to look at sending a few more uh, forms of communication to people. All right, let's jump in and have a look at why landing pages. So uh, we'll do a quick dive. We're gonna just cover a few points on some slides, give you a little bit of background, and then we'll jump in and actually have a look at the editor as well. So as I'm doing that, please feel free to jump into Q&A if you do have any particular questions you wanted to raise. So one of the uh, one of the key questions people want to, to understand about landing pages um, is sometimes why. Okay, so I've, I've got a CMS, I've got a website. Why do I really need Eloqua landing pages? We bought Eloqua because it sends emails. Well, yes, it does. But um, there's some benefit and some pretty serious benefits to looking at landing pages as not a replacement for the CMS. That's absolutely not what Eloqua landing pages are all about. Uh, they're to augment your campaign uh, and to reinforce your campaign and to assist with the goal of conversion. So if we think about things like lead capture, certainly whether people are coming in from advertising online or offline, certainly things like the QR code has seen a resurgence, certainly in this country, and I'm, I'm sure in most of your parts of the world as well, the QR code has had a little bit of a renaissance, which is kind of cool. And so uh, that can be a great way to get people from offline, online. Uh, delivering them to an eloquent landing page is a benefit because you're able to remove all of the noise and distraction that typically we see on websites. People get, I see shiny buttons and flashing lights and moving things, et cetera, and they want to uh, click away. So they, they're driven to the page, to your website, uh, but then they get distracted and taken away. So the beauty of an eloquent landing page is to sort of help strip back and really leave the focus on the form uh, and explaining clearly why people need to fill in that form and what the value is to them. Event registration is another clear winner. So events are a, a hallmark of Eloqua. I think everybody that has Eloqua does events in some form, whether it's uh, webinars, certainly over the last couple of years, but certainly uh, in-person and face-to-face -face type events as well. Um, microsites for content is another great uh, way to use uh, to use Eloqua. Post-event surveys. I uh, had a colleague recently attend an event with a company who's in the digital world, and you think would <laughs> you think would know better, but at the end of the event, they put down uh, pieces of paper on everybody's chair, uh, asking them to tick the boxes. You know, you know, how good was the presenter? How good was the food? What did you think of the venue? Yada yada yada. And, uh, you know, we just thought really like maybe a piece of paper with a QR code <laughs> or even just putting the QR code on the presentation at the end of the event, et cetera, so people can scan it. That way it's captured digitally. It's much easier for you to analyze. And for most people, it's much easier for them to provide that feedback than having to pick up a pen and paper and try and, you know, write up different details. So post-event surveys is another really good uh, way to use your eloquent landing pages. Thought leadership can be another great way. So you'll probably have a variety of approaches to your thought leadership that you publish. Some of it people can simply click and download, which is great. Um, you'll know that they've done it anyway. Uh, if they're a known contact, you'll be able to see that it's stored against their profile and be able to create a segment and identify those people. However, you may have more high value content that warrants putting a form in place. So capturing the details of various people so that you can ask a few more questions, a few more profile questions, understand them a little bit better. Uh, and then always a great idea to send the person a confirmation email at the conclusion of that process. Preference centers is another great thing. So uh, as Eloqua users, you'll be very familiar with uh, having sort of out of the box uh, Eloqua uh, preference center. Now, if your organization is one brand, um, that's that's fine. Uh, as soon as you're an organization though that has multiple brands, um, the out of the box solution doesn't really work that well. So that's when you would move <clears throat> that preference center construct to a series of landing pages to better address that and to better address the, the multiple brands that you might be dealing with. Um, and other microsites that you might develop. So whether they be 
just for temporary purposes. Maybe it's a specific campaign that you're wanting to, to have a look at. But we'll show you some examples here uh, shortly as well so you can see some, some ideas that might, uh, might inspire you, hopefully. So the other barrier that I see sometimes with customers is they have a perception that an Elecor landing page, well, it can't look like my website. <clears throat> well, that's, that's hogwash. <laughs> it absolutely can. Um, and it's just a little bit of CSS magic that's needed in order to make that happen. So uh, our front-end developers did this for me some time ago. Uh, we worked on the, the CSS. We made it look very similar to our website. Not identical by design, um, but very similar. So the font and the colors, et cetera, those sorts of things, the way the forms behave, uh, and the way the forms look actually as well uh, is all driven by CSS uh, from our website. So Eloqua talks to that and a little bit of JavaScript magic, et cetera. But the nice thing is once that coding is done once, it's done. It's not something that you need to do again and again and again. So I just have that built into all of my landing page templates and I literally never need to touch it. I just don't have to worry about it. Um, I just simply go ahead and build my landing pages and the CSS takes care of the rest. So very simple to do. It's not uh, certainly not onerous, um, but once done, it's done uh, and you don't need to modify or change it. It's only if, if the website changes dramatically and you obviously want your electrical landing pages to look much the same, then of course you'll need to do a little bit of an update on that CSS for Eloqua as well. But um, but yeah, it's certainly not a barrier. So don't, don't ever feel like that's an excuse to not use them. And as I was saying there, the, the smartest way to get the most success is to create templates. So once you've got templates created, uh, you'll be in a much better position to, to do things quickly. And you'll find that you'll start to build templates for various purposes. So you'll have maybe a webinar series of templates. You'll have a, an in-person event uh, series of templates, maybe thought leadership downloads, um, standard ideas for pages that you want to host videos on, for example. And so all of these can become various templates that you would keep and they just, they're managed by somebody who hopefully owns the branding uh, within the organization so they can keep them fresh and up to date uh, as needed. But as long as your users can go to a template library, they're in a much better position to have success and to have success quickly versus, you know, rummaging around through folder structures to find, well, which is the most recent, or oh, that one's a bit old, or this one looks okay, when in fact it may not be. Plus, they've got to get rid of all the hyperlinks, and then they've got to add them, so it just gets cumbersome. So using a, a template library is a, a much smarter way to, to do that, and much safer. All right, so by design, your editors are the same. Okay, so we're looking at the design editors uh, in this uh, 101 series. And uh, so it basically, if you can build an email in Eloqua, you can very easily build a landing page. Uh, it's really quite simple. There's a, a few differences, but very little. So the key one being that a landing page allows you to add and host a form. Um, you can also host and watch YouTube or Vimeo assets on your Eloqua landing page, which can be desirable instead of sending people from an email off to um, off to YouTube or Vimeo, for instance, where you may lose them. By presenting the video directly to them on an Eloqua landing page, you have much greater control over that experience. Plus you're giving them your brand experience instead of a YouTube experience or a Vimeo experience. So something to think about there. Um, you can also present a carousel with rotating images. That's one of the features on the landing page. Uh, we haven't used it a great deal, but we have used it where, from a screen real estate point of view, we're just wanting to get across a number of messages. And so using a visual um, bit of movement, bit of light and shining movement, movement uh, it can make things a little bit easier for people and uh, get the message across. And of course, it's a web page. That is obviously the key difference. It's a web page at the end of the day, and it's accessed via a URL. And once you assign that URL, uh, it's live on the internet and you're ready to go. And uh, the fact there is it's quick and it's live uh, in minutes if necessary. So let's have a look at a couple of examples I wanted to show you. One, the first one is in fact from Oracle, which I, you know, hopefully that should be a good example. What, uh, what Oracle have done here, this is actually their CMS. It's not an Eloqua landing page, but what I wanted to point out to you here was the integration with Eloqua. So for example, I come here to the Gartner Magic Quadrant report. I click on that. 
I then get a pop-up where it asks for my email address. Now, if you do this, um, it may ask for a little bit more information, but I've downloaded so many things from LFWord that I don't think there's any more progressive profiling left for them to ask me. So it's just email address. So I pop in my email address, I hit continue, and, um, and then I get another pop-up and I can read the report. So once I click on that button, uh, I then load the, the report. Actually, it takes me off to Gartner, I think, from memory uh, because it's copyrighted, et cetera, and those sorts of things. But that's just one example of integrating a form from Eloqua into your CMS, which is a very doable thing uh, and something that's done fairly regularly. It's almost a Eloqua 101. All right. So this one is just a, a standard marketing cube page that we use from a thought leadership point of view. So form on the left, front page of the document on the right, a little bit more information below. And then basically that piece that you see at the bottom there, the large red section with marketing cube and the addresses and details, that's actually shared content. So what that means, the benefit of using shared content uh, is that as soon as things change, this is actually an old photograph too, I'm not, or an old screenshot I'm noticing, it's uh, things like 2022, the copyright, for example. So on the 1st of January next year, while everyone's partying and I may be a little hungover, hopefully, uh, I'll come into Eloqua and simply make the change in the footer, in the, so in the shared content, and every single asset that we have in play uh, will then be updated simultaneously. So that's the nice thing about shared content. Uh, really a time saver and just helps save time and deliver continuity across all of your assets, which is good. All right, another example. So this one is from a longstanding client of ours, American Express. And this was devised, as you would probably imagine, being a Qantas promotion <laughs> for their Australian business lounges. And so this was designed to be on an iPad. Uh, it was uh, a series of eloquent landing pages uh, designed specifically to sit in uh, the lounges around the country, uh, the, the flight lounges, that is, and um, just ask a few questions. So um, ask them, if, you know, are you a business owner? Yes or no? Do you have an Amex Express business card? Yes or no, et cetera. Tell us a little bit more, pop in those details, et cetera, and then submit and you're off and running. This one is a microsite where we host a bunch of replays and there's every chance that some of you on the call today have even visited this particular page. So uh, this one just basically provides uh, access to a whole bunch of replays. We access, or update these probably once a quarter or so. We just sort of go in, have a look at which ones are being accessed the most, bring in some new content, et cetera, uh, and giving people a chance to, uh, to have a look at that. So that's another example. And, then, and being able to personalize them along the way is obviously one of the key things as well. Now, there are three others I just want to quickly show you, different applications of, of landing pages. One is a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a series uh, that we did. And this series um, was for sales and marketing uh, alignment. And um, basically this, so this originally where it says access the replay, originally it said uh, register now. And then as the different webinars, this happened over, was there five webinars? I think it was five webinars. This happened over a five month period. And so we just maintained this page. So it would say register, and this one would say coming soon, uh, et cetera, depending on whatever the topic and how we wanted to do it. But, um, but yeah, so it just basically then easily morphed from that into a microsite, which we've sort of maintained. Uh, and keep up to date where people can now access the replay. So by clicking on any of those links, they'll take it off to a replay page where they can then access the relevant replays, like so. Now let's have a look at the next one. So this next one uh, is a blog post. Now you might think, well, hang on, a blog post. Why is that an eloquent landing page? That's a really good question. So this particular blog post we had written by one of our staff, um, on seven CX strategy pitfalls to avoid. And this actually forms part of our nurture, primary lead nurture campaign. So we wanted to keep it really tight. Um, it, it's, uh, we believe, uh, hopefully, a piece of high value content. 
Um, and this is accessed through some of the nurturing campaigns that we deliver to people. So we're able to obviously keep track of who's visiting that particular page, um, sort of keep an eye on that, and it just helps inform conversation, et cetera. It's a decent read. Uh, it's certainly not a, a bullet point. It, it really does go into quite a bit of detail on a whole range of, of different points. You'll see we've slotted in a, a contact us halfway down the page there. Um, key takeaways, everybody loves a bullet point. <laughs> so there's uh, bullet points at the bottom. Uh, and then we do provide a uh, option here at the bottom for people to access the guide, so to speak. So a B2B content marketing guide. So another opportunity for us to ask a little bit more information. That one is gated. So people will need to fill in the form uh, in order to access that one. Then a joint campaign. So this is one uh, that we hosted with Oracle. And one of the key things I wanted to show you here was what can, the way you build out the landing page, it can kind of create the illusion of it being a little microsite, which kind of is a little microsite, but for you and I, um, it's really just two eloquent landing pages. That's all it is. And they just link directly to each other uh, without opening in a new browser tab. So it sort of behaves like a, a website, so to speak. So um, we just thought it would be good to try and reduce a little bit of the uh, page size, um, registration details, presenters. Um, you could obviously add other, uh, maybe agenda, whatever, if you wanted to break that out in a little bit more detail, et cetera, whatever it is or however it is you wanted to do it. But again, a little bit different here. We just, being a joint campaign, we had different, slightly different footer uh, on this one. But, uh, but yeah, so again, another slightly different example uh, of what, what that looks like. So we often hear reasons uh, from people, well, we can't use eloquent landing pages because dot, dot, dot. So we need, a, a brand, we need the brand or we need the landing page to be on brand. Well, of course you do. And that's absolutely no problem. Uh, there's no barrier to that from an eloquent point of view. Um, we've just always used the website. Well, that's just a pretty lame excuse, so I, I won't go into any more detail on that one. Um, IT says we have to use the website. Well, that, yeah, that's an interesting one, right? Um, we need to be able to take pages down easily. Well, that's actually something that is super simple uh, from an eloquent point of view. It's literally the flick of a switch, uh, and that's all you need to do. Um, eloquent landing pages aren't secure, no SSL. That's not true. Um, Eloqua these days, um, certainly over the last couple of years, uh, SSL is really just becoming the standard. Uh, and if your pages are not secure, um, there's a lapse in process somewhere. there. If you need a hand with that, please let us know. Uh, it's certainly not difficult. Um, you just need to buy some certificates and you're good to go. Um, can we style Eloqua landing pages? Well, yes, we can. And so that was the point I made earlier in relation to the... Um, the, sorry, the CSS, making sure you've got CSS on the page as well. Does Eloqua have landing pages? I have heard a customer say that one once, and I just had to throw that in for a bit of a laugh. But yes, obviously it does. <laughs> That's what we're talking about today. Key benefits, personalization. So if someone says to you, why should we use the Eloqua landing page over using uh, the CMS? It's not necessarily a binary exercise. That's the other key thing to understand. We're not suggesting that, and as I said earlier, that there's no way on earth that we are ever suggesting to any client that your Eloqua landing pages would replace the CMS. Just, yeah, not going to happen. That's just crazy. So um, key benefits of differentiating, but why would we do it on an Eloqua landing page? Personalization is a big one. The fact that you can greet people by name when they reach that page, the fact that a form can partially pre-populate using progressive profiling and general field mergers on that form is a, a big reason to, uh, to use the Eloqua landing pages. Dynamic content is another really good reason. So if you're driving people to that page and you know who they are, then let's use, whether it's imagery or text, et cetera, absolutely, you can, um, um, absolutely, you can use some dynamic content to personalize that in a bit more detail. The YouTube and Vimeo embed is a great feature. Uh, the fact that you're able to do that without sending people away to an external site, i.e. YouTube or Vimeo, keep them in your branded experience with your calls to action uh, on a single page is a much nicer experience. Um, so a question here. Hi, Derek. The speakers and registration page that you're showing 
Was that an eligible landing page? Yes, it is. Can we have registration forms separately and speakers sections separately? Absolutely, you can. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let me finish here and I'll, I'll show you in a second when we jump in and have a look at the landing pages as to how you do it. It's so simple. You'll, <laughs> when you see it, you'll, uh, you'll get it. So the other nice thing is pages are live in minutes. So literally, now when I say live in minutes, my assumption is that you're working from a template. Okay, if you're working from a template, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that's obviously going to be a much faster process. If you're starting with a blank sheet of paper, so to speak, then obviously it's going to take a little bit longer. But you don't want to be in a position where you're starting from a blank sheet of paper. That's that's not the ideal outcome. All right. So some facts about eloquent landing pages. You know, yes is the most common response to questions I am able to give customers when they ask, oh, is this possible? Yes is my favorite response because it's HTML at the end of the day. So if the design editor, for whatever reason, isn't able to quite do what you want because maybe you require some really super funky different something uh, on your website, well, there's always the source editor that can be used, uh, which does require some HTML skills. Uh, and there are plenty of Eloqua users out there who have those skills, that's not a problem. But if that's not you, then, and then you're like me, <laughs> then the design editor is the place to go. You can add the CSS, it really can mimic the website in so many aspects. It takes seconds to put uh, take an Eloqua page down. It literally is the flick of a switch. Um, and SSL really should be added to all of your landing pages. So if your pages on landing pages are not secure, that's something that you really want to have a look at sooner rather than later. So don't don't um, don't let that one slip. All right. So this is the page here. So all this is this is one landing page. And what I've done is I've built out that particular page and um, have created a second page. I've done a save as, so it's absolutely identical. But you will notice as I click on presenters, you will notice the page obviously refreshes there pretty quickly. Okay. So that's because it's actually loading a second page. The key difference is that when I click from registration, and click on presenters, instead of saying open in a new browser tab, I'm, I'm asking it not to. So let's show you where that is. So here are some of our templates. I'll just grab a confirmation page for fun. Yes, <laughs> video replay buttons. Okay, so here it is here. So this is just a, a cheat essentially as to what I've done. So all you're going to do, if you imagine this is the page that we were just looking at there a moment ago, which is registration and speakers. So all I'm doing is uh, going over here. And in this case, I'm adding another landing page. And so I'll select any random page in my diary here at the minute. But you'll notice here the default when people click on the link, the default is to open in a new window. So all I've done is change that to none. Okay, so that then means when I'm clicking here between the registration and what appear to be buttons, which they kind of are, I suppose, or, or browser tabs sort of, um, they're really just buttons, essentially. The difference is I'm not opening the second page in a new browser tab. Um, I'm not doing anything. It's just simply moving between one between the other. So it then creates the illusion uh, of, uh, and if you think about events and things like that, sometimes the, the content for your event becomes quite significant um, and it just doesn't make sense to have it all on a single page. And so having something like this, a little bit of a menu structure, or a quasi menu structure uh, can make that process a little bit more interesting for people. So that's all it is. So hopefully, um, Shavangi, I hope I answered that correctly. And I do hope I answered your or uh, pronounced your name correctly. So thank you very much for uh, that question. All right. So you saw as I accessed this particular uh, template that. Um, it's basically everything's kind of there ready for me to go. This is a confirmation page for somebody who has accessed uh, some thought leadership. So it doesn't contain a menu structure. So I'll just take that out. But you can see we're all kind of all ready to go pretty much. Everything's there. I've got links set. Um, 
I've got a note here, you know, keep it short, etc. A standard call to action, for instance, with our phone number and, and contact us here. That goes off to our standard uh, website to, or, sorry, standard landing page to uh, submit a form and, and send us a note. This typically is where we will put the front page, a reproduction of the front page of the thought leadership piece. Um, put a link behind that one as I would put the link behind download now, etc. Put in the name of the white paper. So all these are prompts to help me follow a process uh, to keep things in line and to have greater continuity across the various campaigns uh, that we might be building. Okay. Um, down the bottom here, we have shared content. So remember, the beauty of shared content is that doesn't matter where I place that shared content, there's only one master. And if I update the master, every single place where that shared content is being used will be simultaneously updated. Super helpful. Uh, just like our logo here at the top, that's also shared content. And I just made some changes there. There we go. So that uh, that's also shared content. So if we make any changes to logo, for instance, again, I can make it in one place and literally hundreds of pages uh, will all simultaneously uh, be updated. Kevin, um, can you show how and where you save the shared content? Sure, Kevin, no problems. So shared content is available through uh, your component library under shared content. So you've probably noticed it uh, when you've been looking at images and files, which is probably what you spend most of your time doing in the component library. But yes, shared content is right here. So those particular, there's a couple that I've got of shared content. Um, I call it AO, which is always on. <laughs> so that helps me find things. So let's have a look. Yeah, so this is a, a piece of shared content that we sometimes use to drop into different uh, landing pages. Um, so again, I didn't want to have to create this every single time, um, but I wanted there to be a central location for this. Now, the difference between your shared content and content blocks is significant, right? So the concept of shared content is that I have a single master right here. Now, if I make any changes to this piece of shared content, everywhere else where that shared content is currently being displayed will simultaneously be updated. That's the key difference, right? It's one master uh, and it's just repeated everywhere. Don't confuse that or don't be confused. Yeah, don't be confused in relation to blocks. So blocks are contained within your landing page editor as well as your email editor. The difference here is as soon as I grab a piece uh, or grab a block and drop it into my landing page, what you see here now is a duplicate of what was sitting in the block content library sitting here on the left. So any changes I make here now, um, are in no way reflective of the master. So I can go ahead and get rid of that, for instance, but you'll see if I drag in another one, there we go. The master, well, the, the original remains the same uh, and I'm just con constantly bringing it out. So the, the idea of content blocks is to save time to help you build fresh content, uh, help you stay on brand, keep things aligned, image sizes, you know, buttons are already configured because as you know, when you're building with Eloqua and you drag a button in from the left, it's that beautiful blue, okay? Which is probably a lovely blue, but it's probably not your brand. It's certainly not our brand, etc. So the nice thing about using content blocks is that you've got the ability to stay on brand uh, and have consistency in how things look. Kevin, does that answer your question? Then the other key parts are the styling pieces. So canvas width, uh, you've got options to play with. Um, <clears throat> I tend to stick between 1080 and 1320 pixels. Generally 1320 yeah, is the default that we run with at Marketing Cube. Um, I choose not to do 100% only because I'm not 100% happy uh, with the way that it displays necessarily. Um, what I what I want it to do is, for instance, to have the 
logo and maybe the banner image to be 100% across the page, but I want the main body of the page to be restricted to, for instance, 1320 uh, pixels, and I can't do that. I can do that in the source editor, uh, but I choose not to use the source editor because I want to stay away from the HTML. So for me, that's probably one of the only compromises I really have with using the design uh, editor versus the source editor. It's just that one thing. Um, I have a strong feeling that's going to be rectified uh, in future versions of Eloqua, but uh, that probably would be the single, yeah, that'd be really be the, the main reason or the, the, the only limitation, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say um, in relation to, um, to using landing pages. Um, this is where the CSS goes. So this is just a little bit of code that our team have put in. And what that's doing is pointing to a secure server where our CSS is hosted. That CSS can actually be hosted in Eloqua, by the way, just simply in your file. Uh, in your component library, um, but we, we from, I don't know why our developers chose to do it that way, but they've got it sitting on our secure server uh, where they can access it and, and make changes should they need to. You've got all of your defaults for font colors, hyperlink colors, et cetera. Um, you've obviously got the ability to play around with backgrounds. Now I'll throw a hideous color in there just to give you a quick example. Um, you can also change the canvas color as well. So you've got control uh, over what you're doing there. Um, I'll return those to white. Um, you can play with colors up the, the left and right hand side. So again, if I just choose a revolting color so you can sort of see it and it doesn't merge between the two. I think you'll agree that looks pretty hideous, that particular color combination, but you get the point. You've got the ability to, to play around there a little bit. One other thing that you've got on uh, the landing pages that you don't get in emails, which is because you're it's a browser, essentially. When we click on the button over here on the left-hand side, there's a feature called hover state. So hover state means it just... Can you see how the button is changing color there a little? So as soon as my mouse drags over the button, um, it's just called hover state. And so all it's doing is just adjusting the shading a little bit to so visually, um, hopefully people notice that when they're clicking and doing different things, it just hopefully draws their attention uh, to that particular feature or that button that you're trying to get their attention in. All right, let me show you another landing page. The user group, obviously, you have an Eloqua landing page experience every month uh, when you join us. And so let me just bring up the November uh, user group page. What I learned from the Australian session that we did earlier this week is that trying to do Eloqua landing pages and forms in a single one-hour webinar is probably next to impossible. But, um, but let me quickly show you. Basically, the construction of your form, so the fields and where the fields are laid out, etc., the way they behave, so on and so forth, that's all controlled within the form editor itself. Once you get onto the landing page, though, the landing page then gives you a little bit more flexibility to really adjust some of the cosmetics and also some of the spacing um, that you'll see. So once you click on the form, um, you'll see here you've got background color that you can play with so you can adjust and do things like so. And then you can play around with all of these from a pixel point of view, uh, which can spread your buttons out, bring them closer together, all that sort of stuff. So get them to a point that you're, you're happy. Um, your font size as well. Um, you probably don't generally want to hide a form on mobile, but the option is there should you want to. Um, abilities to add borders around them, et cetera, and so on and so forth. So if you ever need to replace them, uh, one thing I, I do uh, from a, uh, well, yeah, from a template point of view, uh, let me just jump out of that one. So if we look at this, yeah, this one. What I do is I've created a form that I never intend to use. It's, it's literally called replace me, I think. Um, and the reason I've done that is that from a template point of view, 
and you can see it right here. So it's called replace this form. <laughs> and so the form does nothing, but it, the purpose it serves is that I can drop it into my templates and then I can take care of all of this styling, okay? The, the flip side is if you don't do it, what you potentially end up with is just this placeholder. And that placeholder is great, but when the person drops the form into that placeholder, they then have to go through the process of adding the background color, adjusting the field spacing, blah, 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 and adjusting those to whatever they want. But I find this is a little bit faster. This just saves me time, essentially, that I don't need to worry about any of those things. All I do literally is come in here each month for the user group, which is a great example, find my form, which is the November form, and I drop it in, and there's nothing else I need to do. It's just ready to go. So that's where a, a template, again, can save time uh, and make things just a little bit easier uh, and deliver that consistency that you're wanting as well. So that's a, a quick and easy tip for you. All right, so one of the key things that we're trying to achieve um, and one of the reasons I gave you for using the Eloqua landing page um, in place of the CMS for some things is the ability from a, to, for personalization. So that use of field mergers and things like dynamic content really do make a difference. So the primary purpose of a landing page is really to host a form and to convert the visitor via a form submission. That's really probably why uh, you're going to be using Eloqua landing pages. It could be a form for a webinar. It could be a form for an in-person event. It could be a form for a conference of some sort. It could be to access thought leadership. It could be to obtain feedback following an event of some sort or a, a short survey potentially um, that you wanted to deliver to people. But one of the key things you want to focus on when you think about the design of your Eloqua landing pages is don't just simply carte blanche for make a, a, a direct duplicate of your website because the reason or one of the benefits of your Eloqua landing page is to remove some of the distractions. And um, you certainly want to do that. So if I jump in, if we look at say Marketing Cube as an example. So our website is reasonably simple. It's not overly sort of complex, um, just a standard sort of menu structure like so. If I scroll all the way to the bottom, um, you'll see some standard contact us. You'll see this section that looks a little bit familiar, like you saw on our landing pages, but the website then also has this other menu structure here at the bottom uh, as well. So what we've elected to do, uh, if I go here, for example, you can see that we pretty much have just repeated this section, that's it. And as for the top of the page, it's just the logo. And that's it. Uh, we have a contact us usually in the form of a button um, sitting out here on the page as well. Uh, but that's really it because we don't want to distract people and have them go away, obviously, and, and miss the key things. We always make sure there's a link to our homepage, though, behind the logo. So wherever the logo appears, there is a link to our homepage because we feel that's a fairly standard expectation by most people that that should be, I should be able to click on a logo and I should be able to reach the homepage of an organization uh, if I do that. And yeah, I, th I think that makes sense. So, but yeah, as you can see, it's, it's stripped back and it's very focused. Um, there's not a lot of things for you to be able to click on except for what it is that I really want you to do as someone visiting uh, our various assets and different pages. Um, actually, while I've got you here on our website, can I very proudly share with you that two of our global clients, the Flight Center Travel Group, which is an Australian-based organization, but is a global travel brand, um, won a Marquee Award this year in Las Vegas, just last month uh, in Vegas. So that was a, a, they won the best global CX program, uh, which we helped them design and build. So we were thrilled to be a part of that. Um, thank you for the thumbs up. The, um, the other one was Viatris, which um, is a pharmaceutical firm, perhaps known to some of you, but um, so one of their products that you will definitely know is an EpiPen. An EpiPen can be a life-saving device. Um, and we've built for them, uh, along with their agency partners, um, um, an Eloqua 
campaign of, of, of emails, always on campaigns, landing pages that basically serve as a reminder service for people with their EpiPens. Because apparently one of the key problems people have with EpiPens is they do have expiry dates. They don't, they don't last forever uh, and you need to manage them. And so this is a reminder service for people where once they purchase their EpiPen, they can register it through the website and then the website will remind them, send them nice reminders to let them know, hey, your EpiPen is expiring in the next month or so. Um, it's a good time to think of discarding and making sure you, you know, get a new one at home or in the office or the emergency kit, wherever you have your EpiPen. So yeah, we were really pumped. So they won the Thinker Award for Best CX Innovation. So we were absolutely thrilled to have two of our clients uh, be recognized on a global platform like that. So uh, congratulations to them. Um, and you might hear a little bit more about that from us uh, in the coming weeks. All right, that's enough gloating, forgive me. All right. So the next part of this exercise is creating an on-brand experience. So previewing and testing your pages uh, is pretty critical. Uh, and you often want to see some results, right? You want to have a look in Insight and Dashboards uh, to see what's going on as well. So let's uh, have a look at what that can look like. So previewing your landing pages helps you validate the dynamic content and field mergers to make sure they're functioning as you would expect. Um, and it's typically a good idea, especially if there's progressive profiling involved in forms, try and view those pages in incognito mode. If you keep testing using your own email address in your standard browser, or you use a different email address, maybe you use your work one, then you use your personal one, um, what you're going to end up with is cookie confusion, uh, which will only confuse you and certainly confuse your browser at the same time. So having separate uh, and different email addresses based on different profiles is a really good idea. So let's have a look at how we might do that. So I need to save one. So let's get one that, uh, this is under construction, so forgive me, it's not actually quite finished yet, as you can see by the placeholder at the top of the page. But um, it's really exactly the same as your uh, email preview function. It must always be viewed in the context of, uh, of an individual. And so what you can see here, we covered this, we've covered this a few times this month, or this year, sorry. So this is uh, our Marketing Cube email accounts are managed by Google Gmail. And so there's a specific Gmail function that is really cool. So my email address is just Derek at marketingcube.com.au. However, by adding in a plus icon and then putting a, a different, well, in this case, you can see USA uh, after it, uh, I can then build out a whole profile on that contact. Um, and the benefit of that is really from a testing point of view. Um, and, but the nice thing is any email sent to that email address, Derek plus USA at, um, just simply comes into my work email address. So uh, it makes life a lot easier from that point of view. All right, so let's click on preview. And just as you would have experienced from an email point of view, uh, the same previews uh, are available here as well. That's the company name, um, Uncle Sam Inc. That's my uh, profile name, or my company name in my USA profile. Um, there's not much more, there's a little bit more dynamic content, but I'm yet to build it actually uh, for this particular page. But, um, and actually maybe this is a nice segue. The, the next part is to go through some of the new reports that are available. Um, actually, this is perfect. So the database growth trend report. So I'm just going to quickly slip into release 22D quickly because we're running out of time here. But uh, there are three new insight reports that are available for you. Um, database growth trend, which is the one that you can see on the screen right now in front of you. The nice part about this one is you can go back uh, to 1999, for those of you who may have been with Eloqua for quite some time, but uh, you can go back in time, which is nice. You might notice that the dashboard that you've got at the moment in Eloqua only goes for rolling 90 days. So it's kind of harder to get the bigger picture uh, mm -hmm. of what's going on. Then, then it also gives you, so in that page you scroll down, it then gives you a month by month um, change, uh, total contacts, new contacts, uh, rates up and down and so on and so forth, reachable rates and growth up and down, et cetera. So I think it's a much 
better report. It gives you a lot more information uh, and quite a bit more granular information. So that's your database growth trend report available in Insight. Then another one is contact field analysis. Uh, this one's early days. It's a good report. I think there's merit to it. It's good, but it doesn't allow you to have a look at custom contact fields at this stage. So at the moment, it's really just the Eloqua system fields. Uh, and essentially what it's showing you there uh, by zooming in, hopefully you can see that a little bit easier. So the, in red is the percentage of populated data uh, or in the blue is the missing values. So you can see here, we have hardly any fax numbers. I'm like, well, it is 2022. I don't know, I can't remember the last time I possibly had hair the last time I used a fax machine. But um, obviously very different in legal circles and, and other parts of other, other industries, but uh, a little bit different in my industry. Um, email address obviously is completely populated. You can't be in Eloqua without having an email address. So that's a no brainer. Um, mobile phone numbers, okay. Uh, zip postcodes, states, provinces, those sorts of things. So if you're thinking about things like, um, like lead scoring uh, and profile points, then this can be quite helpful uh, to give you a better idea as well. Look, we do can't really build a lead score model based on fax numbers because we just don't have enough of those. So it's really not a good point. We need to think about something else uh, to work into it. And this one, I think, will be of uh, particular interest to many of you, which is the new auto open activity analysis report. So what I've done here is I've selected this report, and you can do the same when it's like any standard insight report, you pick a date range. I chose July 2021. And you'll notice that there's there are no auto opens. The auto open is sort of this lighter blue color here, which you can see. And that's why I've highlighted it here with these dots. Um, the auto opens that are displayed. And same with auto clicks. Um, auto clicks, where we're seeing, this will differ for everybody, but we're seeing very minimal uh, auto clicking, uh, but we're certainly seeing a little bit more of the auto opens. Uh, and then you've got a complete breakdown of actual campaigns and the impacts and the numbers that will appear there. Now, in this particular example, these are all old uh, that you're seeing, some of these, so that's why they're not seeing a lot of information. But if you scroll down, uh, you'll certainly see more information uh, contained in there. So that's a, a bit of a cheat uh, to show you that while showing you preview mode. So it behaves exactly the same as your email does. Um, now, of course, once the page is assigned and you've added a microsite, so the question, um, and Peter, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I have a feeling I'm probably doing a really bad job, but thank you for your question. So the question related to the vanity URL. So you'll notice here, um, I never I never use, if you don't sign a sign, a vanity URL, Eloqua will give you the LP dash and a number, okay? I never use those. Um, I always, I, yeah, I just don't use them because I want my URLs to mean something to me because when I go to my reporting and I look at the reporting, I get the URL, okay? Now, if I, when I look at that reporting and it's just simply the subdomain college marketingcube.com.au slash LP dash 2491, I have absolutely no idea what that landing page is all about. However, if I use a naming convention to build out my URLs, um, then I'm having much better success from a reporting point of view. I can look at a page and if a page has thousands of visitors, I, and I know exactly what it is by looking at the URL. I don't have to plug it into a browser, click on it, et cetera, et cetera. So I personally never use them. Uh, I always uh, use and, and have my own vanity URL. Uh, in place. Now, from a Google, so your other part of your question related to Google Analytics, and I'm going to want to tell you that you probably need to go in here, and this may depend on your level of access, but the, the tracking uh, of, and no, this isn't going to be the right place, I can never remember how to get here. The problem is you do this once and then you just, you never have to do it again. Um, so maybe it's back here somewhere. 
but there is some, <laughs> I apologize guys, this is not something I do every day, but there's basically a place here in Eloqua where you put in your Google uh, Analytics account number into Eloqua. So for instance, when I log into Google Analytics, I see all of my Eloqua campaigns, landing pages are thrown into the mix. Um, email is a, is a pretty significant feeder uh, as visitors to our website. Um, and so that's all kind of tracked and, and managed in that process. Um, hopefully that helps, your, helps answer your question. If that doesn't really answer your question, please send me an email once the, the session finishes today, if you maybe could expand on that point for me um, and we'll see if we get a little bit more uh, information for you uh, to assist with that one. I just cannot for the life of me remember, you would think it would be under website setup, but clearly it's not and it's not under tracking. <coughs> Yeah, look, these will all be covered in the blog uh, for you anyway. So if you're running WebEx, you should be aware there's a new app and, and you probably want to get into that as quickly as possible. Um, SMS enhancements, if you're using them from Oracle. Uh, Salesforce app integration changes really have to do with billing fields and just being a little bit smarter in the way that Eloqua manages that. Um, again, we'll put all this information into the blog for you. This is probably one of the, the nicest ones and we'll finish on this note if you like. So some of you may have noticed if you're keen users of the dashboards that as you navigate through the different dashboards and sort of click through, um, it was kind of a little bit counterintuitive as to how you got back to that dashboard home screen. And so what has been added now is this link right here. So it's not, it's not mind it's like, oh my gosh, isn't that amazing? It's really just a button, but it's a fantastic little button because that will then take you directly back to the homepage or well, the dashboard homepage, I should say. Um, such a little thing, um, but a, a great thing and certainly makes that process uh, of navigating quite a bit easier, which is cool. But um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to stay on the line. Uh, for a few more minutes uh, to answer any of those. But um, send an email, sure. Thank you very much, Peter. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, if you do have any questions, please stay on the line. If not, uh, we will see you again in February next year. So we'll, we'll send you some details over the winter summer break uh, or winter break for you guys. And uh, we look forward to seeing you then. But thank you again. Have a wonderful day, everybody.